So welcome everybody to the uh, first talk of the year uh, on behalf of the IEEE MTTS Santa Clara Valley San Francisco Joint Chapter. I would like to welcome you to the first technical presentation of the year. Uh, I apologize uh, on behalf of the chapter. There were some security breaches. We had some uh, people spamming uh, obscene text messages and such. So uh, we've managed to remove them for now. Uh, hopefully uh, the measures we took uh, will keep them out. So moving on to the talk itself, we had a very strong uh, response uh, in terms of registration. We had more than 650 people registered and uh, already we can see a lot of people are uh, joining the talk uh, so we hope to see close to 200 people in the talk today. Uh, so the, the title of the talk today is uh, Fundamentals of Millimeter Wave and Sub-Terahertz Frequency Generation Synthesis Radiation for Multi-Antenna Arrays and Transceivers. Our speaker, uh, very distinguished speaker today, Dr. Payam Hidari, who is a distinguished microwave lecturer, IEEE MTTS. Uh, so uh, before we get to the talk itself, uh, there's a few... Uh, things to note. So to take us through the agenda for today, I would like to invite our secretary, Mr. Venkata Ramagade. Uh, Venkata, let me see, I should be able to unmute you. Uh, hi, Utkarsh. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, sorry, sorry again. Um, we had some issues and uh, hopefully we resolve them now. Um, so thank you everyone again for attending the first uh, MTTSCV chapter start this year. Uh, I will introduce the agenda uh, for today and go over some of the logistic items for this meeting. Um, and uh, Utkarsh uh, later will also introduce our speaker today and go over the abstract for the talk. And we will have a Q&A um, session as well, you know, as we progress through the talk. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, a few things to note. Um, so this meeting is recorded on Zoom uh, and we will send out the meeting slides and the recorded video to all registrants. Uh, please, please, please make sure that the cameras are turned off and microphones are muted to help avoid any issues, um, bandwidth related, background noise, you know, any, any other issues. Please post your questions in the chat window to everyone. We will take breaks periodically uh, and try to get the answers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, please also ensure that your display name in Zoom matches the one you use to register. This will make it easier for us to check you in. Um, and as and and uh, as you uh, as we are actually going through the talk, uh, we will be registering all the participants. And uh, if if you did not register and you were forwarded the link to this meeting, please send a private message to me in the Zoom window uh, with your name, email address, um, uh, and and uh, and your IEEE member status. You know, uh, with, whether you are a member of IEEE or not, whether you are a member of MTTS chapter or not. We will register and check you in. Um, the next slide. Yeah, and please, please support us by becoming a member. Um, here are the links for joining IEEE. And uh, uh, here is the link for joining the MTTS uh, chapter. Um, and you, ca you guys can follow us on LinkedIn as well. There is a hashtag uh, MTTSCV. Um, so please try to follow us on LinkedIn. The next slide. Um, so for uh, 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 updates on the COVID pandemic. Um, so we will continue having all our uh, meetings and office meetings and technical meetings in the online webinar format only uh, until further notice. So uh, uh, let me also introduce uh, our chapter offices for this year. Uh, I would like to um, in, um, introduce our chair, Utkarsh Krishna, uh, vice chair, Thomas McKay, Secretary, myself, Venkata Gade, and Treasurer, Tan Toy. Um, and uh, yeah, that's our office uh, uh, roster for this year. And uh, I would like to hand over to Utkash for introducing our uh, speaker for today. Thank you. 
Thanks, Venkata. So uh, it's our great pleasure to have with us uh, Dr. Payam Hidari. Uh, so Dr. Hidari received his BS and MS degrees honors in electrical engineering from Sharif University of Technology in 19, 1992 and 1995, respectively. Uh, he received his PhD degree from the University of Southern California in 2001. He is currently a full professor of electrical engineering at the University of California at, at Irvine. His research covers the design of terahertz, millimeter wave, RF, and analog integrated circuits. He's the co-author of two books, one book chapter, and more than 140 journal and conference papers. He has given the keynote speech to IEEE Global SIP 2013 Symposium on Millimeter Wave Imaging and Communications. Uh, he also served as uh, an invited distinguished speaker to the 2014 IEEE Midwest Symposium on Circuits and Systems and gave a tutorial at the 2017 International Solid State Circuits Conference, uh, ISSCC. He has served as a distinguished lecturer of both the IEEE Solid State Circuit Society uh, from 2014 to 2016 and uh, IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society, that's MPTS uh, 2019 to 2022. And it's in that capacity that uh, uh, he's here with us today. Uh, Dr. Hedari is also the recipient of the 2016 to 2017 UCI School of Engineering Mid-Career Excellence in Research Award, uh, the 2014 Distinguished Engineer Educator Award, and a host of other awards, uh, including but not limited to uh, the 2005 IEEE Circuits and Systems uh, Society Darlington Award uh, and the 2005 National Science, Science Foundation Career Award, the 2005 Henry Samueli School of Engineering Teaching Excellence Award and the Best Paper Award at the 2000 IEEE International Conference on Computer Design. Uh, he was recognized as the 2004 Outstanding Faculty in the EECS Department of the University of California at Irvine. Uh, his research on novel low power multi-purpose antenna, uh, multi-antenna RF front ends received the low power design contest award at the 2008 Interna IEEE International Sy uh, Symposium on low power electronics and design. The Office of Technology Alliances at US, uh, UCI has named Dr. Hedari one of the 10 outstanding innovators at the university. He's currently a member of the International Technical uh, Program Committee of the ISSCC, an associate editor for uh, the IEEE Solid State Circuits Letters, and a member of ADCOM for the uh, IEEE Solid State Circuit Society. He has served as the guest editor of IEEE Journal of Solid State Circuits and associate editor of IEEE Transactions on Circuits and Systems. He is an IEEE Fellow for contributions to silicon-based millimeter wave integrated circuits and systems. Uh, going on to the talk itself, uh, the title of which is Fundamentals of Millimeter Wave and Sub-Terahertz Frequency Generation, Synthesis and Radiation for Multi-Antenna Arrays and Transceivers, uh, or uh, Multi-Antenna Array Transceivers, rather. Uh, so the description of the talk is as follows. Uh, operation in the millimeter wave and terahertz bands has gained great interest due to abundance of unutilized spectrum and resurgence of new applications in wireless cellular communications most notably 5G. If combined with spectrally efficient demodulation techniques, millimeter wave and terahertz wireless communication has the potential to achieve multi gigabit per second wireless data rates. In addition, the operation at higher frequency gives rise to smaller size passive components, most notably antenna, making it possible to design and implement massive face array or MIMO systems on a single die or single wafer. As the communication system schemes, including spectrally efficient demodulation and carrier aggregation techniques are making progress at RF frequencies, far more challenging requirements will be imposed on the oscillator and frequency synthesis design. Increasing the carrier frequency towards the millimeter wave terahertz regime only makes these requirements more stringent. This lecture, which is one part of actually a series of lectures, will focus on the fundamentals of millimeter wave and sub-terahertz frequency generation synthesis and radiation for multi-antenna array transceivers. So with that, uh, Dr. Hidari, I would like to hand it off to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so can anyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, 
this evening, I'm going to go through uh, the fundamentals of millimeter wave uh, frequency generation, synthesis, and uh, radiation. And if you notice, this uh, uh, title is a little bit kind of slightly different from what was introduced, because I just thought that uh, uh, covering the whole notion and concept of frequency generation, synthesis, and radiation requires more than one hour of lecture. And if you want to include this multi-antenna uh, LO generation, like uh, frequency synthesis generation and distribution, then that requires more than an hour of lecture. So in order to make sure that I confine myself within one hour, I just uh, go to uh, the basics of frequency generation, synthesis, and radiation. Uh, I'd like to also uh, mention that I build my way out of basic concepts. And toward the end of the presentation, you will see a flavor of uh, the use of electromagnetics and physics uh, directly in integrated circuits and the holistic design of radiators and uh, oscillators toward the end of this presentation. Uh, Dr. Hedari, just uh, to just a brief pause there, I uh, just wanted to mention to our viewers, I've had to disable the chat because of the problem we were having earlier. So if you have questions, just email them to me uh, from the confirmation email you must have received from me or, or from the invitation to attend earlier. So just email them to me and I'll, I will take breaks every 15, 20 minutes or so to answer your questions. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so uh, just a brief overview of what is really considered to be a millimeter wave frequency range. A number of applications have been unfolded as a result of this huge amount of activities in millimeter wave frequency range. Of course, you are familiar with 5G uh, frequency range uh, from 26 uh, to 30 gigahertz. Of course, there is another frequency range within the uh, 5G domain uh, at around 38 gigahertz. Then we have the 60 gigahertz frequency range that is primarily used for gigabit per uh, second uh, HD wireless HD uh, frequency range from 77 to 81 gigahertz designated for automotive radars and the W band frequency covering uh, the passive imaging uh, primarily. And then uh, going toward uh, uh, beyond 100 gigahertz frequency, which is something that uh, people uh, in 5G community is discussing are discussing right now. Uh, there is a, a frequency range from around 115 gigahertz to 240 gigahertz that is used for can be used uh, for broadband wireless communication and also uh, high resolution imaging. And uh, the uh, high end of the millimeter wave frequency, which is really kind of the lower end of the terahertz band from 0.3 to uh, 3 terahertz, which is more or less dedicated for uh, terahertz imaging and spectroscopy. Now, essential in the design of uh, uh, primary communication circuits and imaging uh, systems is the notion of frequency synthesizer, which is used for LO generation and uh, local oscillator generation, as you can, uh, as you see, and also for source, degener uh, for source de de generation. So as you can see here, uh, the uh, whole notion of the source generation is very important for a wide range of applications. So in this presentation, I'm going to go through the oscillator design uh, at millimeter wave. I will discuss uh, frequency tuning, in particular inductive tuning, and I make a strong case in favor of inductive tuning, tuning versus uh, in comparison with reactor tuning at millimeter wave frequency. Then I turn my attention to uh, the discussion of uh, a, a fundamental frequency PLL-based uh, synthesizer. And then I will discuss a, a very exciting research on multiport circularly polarized resonator and radiator. This part of the presentation, um, uh, the uh, kind of uh, this part requires great deal of, as I said, descri description of um, uh, or borrowing concepts from the electromagnetic uh, theory. And I do my best to make it simpler so that everyone understands what's going on. First, oscillator design at millimeter wave. Uh, so the challenges in millimeter wave frequency generation synthesis are uh, quite familiar with everyone. I, go, I list a number of important design challenges. Uh, of course, at high uh, frequencies, uh, being able to generate uh, being able to generate sustainable oscillations that can also have uh, high output power is challenging. Uh, like lower frequency. Uh, uh, oscillators, phase noise is always uh, a very important design parameter. And then uh, depending on the application, the tuning range could be very wide. For example, if you think about like a spectroscopy applications, then there is a need for uh, uh, an oscillator that can uh, cover multi uh, gigahertz of frequency range. And uh, as the operation frequency 
uh, approaches close to the maximum oscillation frequency that we call F max, then uh, achieving low phase noise, high output power oscillation is very difficult. Uh, adding to this is the severe loss due to the low quality factor and uh, a small C max over C min ratio that contributes to a dismal uh, tuning range at very high frequencies. So these challenges uh, uh, become much more pronounced at very high frequencies. And then we have to find ways or circuit techniques, uh, um, uh, system techniques in order to kind of uh, mitigate these problems. OK, so I would like to really start with the basics of the uh, uh, sinusoidal oscillator. We know that uh, shown here is a kind of a general system block diagram that uh, is used and we are familiar to kind of uh, describe the oscillator using the concept of feedback. Uh, so uh, an oscillator can be considered uh, a closed loop feedback system, in particular is a positive feedback system. And uh, why we are using a positive feedback system in order to uh, produce sustainable oscillation? Because the basic requirement for a sinusoidal oscillator uh, is uh, uh, comprised of two parts, a pair of small signal complex conjugate right half plane poles, which determine the oscillation frequency and the mechanism for moving these poles toward imaginary axis as the envelope of the output waveform increases. So the first requirement, namely having a right half plane, a pair of right half plane pole is really uh, realizable using this feed, uh, positive feedback network. And then hopefully using the active devices uh, that are used in, uh, let me go to the pointer. Uh, so using the active device here, realizing this H of S, then the uh, gain control mechanism can be conceived that can control the envelope of the output waveform as the oscillation, uh, os oscillation amplitude grows. Now, uh, the next question is that what kind of uh, characteristic H of S should have inside this feedback loop in order to satisfy these two conditions? And without going through the details, we know that uh, if the loop gain in this case, uh, since we are looking at unity gain feedback, uh, the loop gain is equal to the open loop system. Is uh, if the open loop transfer function or the loop gain in this case uh, have uh, a pair of um, two poles, a pair of poles, and one zero, then uh, sinusoidal the oscillation once this system with this one zero and two poles are placed within the uh, positive feedback loop, then uh, the circuit can oscillate. One particular example would be uh, a pair of complex conjugate left half plane pole uh, uh, within that H of S and an H of S with this uh, complex conjugate left half plane pole and the zero, uh, its, transfer, its uh, transfer function or frequency response is given here. And uh, if we look at the root locus of the closed loop transfer function, we know that uh, the, uh, according to the root locus of the transfer function, the closed loop poles are always starting at the location, at the initial location of the open loop poles. Uh, and the root locus, as we know, shows the trajectory of the uh, poles and zero, uh, zeros as the gain will increase. Now, as we increase the gain, you see that this uh, pair of poles are gravitated around the center of gravity. And the center of gravity here is the zero of this transfer function. And they are basically taking a circular trajectory around this uh, center of gravity, which is really the uh, zero at the origin in order to uh, get, um, um, as, as the gain increases, they get to, they emerge together. And then as uh, with, with a further increase of the gain, one of these poles um, will be uh, approaching the zero, the other one goes to infinity. But as you can see, at certain values of the gain, uh, this uh, complex conjugate, the complex conjugate uh, closed loop poles will fall uh, in the right half plane. And as a result, then uh, the uh, condition for oscillation will be satisfied. Now, rewriting this transfer function into another uh, frequency response and then applying this uh, famous Barkhausen criteria, uh, you can, we can calculate the minimum required gain for oscillation and oscillation frequency. And according to the Barkhausen criteria, if the imaginary part of the loop gain uh, is becoming zero and its real part is one, then we can calculate oscillation frequency and the minimum required gain, which for this special case, the oscillation frequency is equal to the natural frequency of this uh, um, system, the, the loop gain, 
and the minimum required gain is one over QT, where QT is related to obviously natural frequency and the damping factor alpha. Now, how to realize this uh, system? Of course, one uh, very straightforward circuitry with this transfer function is an RLC circuit. And we know that a parallel RLC circuit uh, driven by a current source can uh, have a driving point impedance uh, whose characteristic or his uh, closed loop expression is shown here. And as you can see, we have uh, a zero and a pair of complex conjugate pole. And the next question is that how can we then uh, realize this positive feedback, right? Now that we have H of S and one example of H of S uh, is this part of RC tank circuit, then the next question is how can we really implement this positive feedback network? And the uh, uh, answer to this question is also very straightforward. We know that one way of implementing this uh, unity gain positive feedback loop is by using a voltage controlled current source here. In other words, replacing this current source, independent current source, driving this parallel RC tank circuit with a voltage dependent current source here. And this voltage dependent current source uh, the, uh, is uh, basically, as I said, implementing this uh, positive feedback loop in a way that the voltage across the resistor sitting in the second secondary side of this audio transformer is sampled and uh, is taken here. And this voltage is impacting the current and the current is obviously coming back and create the voltage on the primary side of the transformer. And then you uh, establish this loop, right? Uh, so the, the next question is then, what kind of component can possibly realize this voltage dependent current source? And the, you know, of course, we know what the answer is. One single transistor can single-handedly uh, realize this voltage dependent current source here. So uh, again, we started from the uh, system level description of a, uh, an oscillator using a positive, a positive feedback loop. We uh, kind of uh, found or synthesized a circuit that can possibly replace H of S, which is that uh, this RLC, RLC circuit. And then to uh, implement or realize this positive feedback, we use a voltage uh, dependent current source here. And we said that, uh, of course, a voltage dependent current source uh, can be represented or modeled using a single transistor. Now, uh, from here, uh, if I want to replace this uh, voltage dependent current source with a transistor, uh, I arrive at this circuitry where we have the transistor, the auto, this transistor is indeed acting like a voltage dependent current source where the current source is feeding the current to this parallel RC tank circuit. The transformer uh, is uh, placed here. And then the secondary side of the transformer is coming back and is AC coupled to this, uh, the input source of the transistor. And of course, from the input source of the transistor, you see a one over GM, um, which is placed at the secondary side of this transformer. Now, um, of course, there is one way of implementing this uh, circuit. Another way of implementing this circuit or this uh, so-called oscillator is by replacing this transformer with the so-called tapped capacitor networks shown here. And it is proven that this uh, tapped capacitor uh, network can effectively behave like a transformer. And, uh, Suffice to say that then a circuit that has uh, this circuit model is shown here with the transistor. As I said, we replace this transformer with this tapped capacitor resonator here. The voltage is uh, again sampled at the output. Uh, the output is taken at the drain of this transistor. The output is sampled by this tapped capacitor resonator, is fed back to the input, and then the voltage control current source takes care of this feedback and then injecting current to this RLC tank circuit. Um, so without going through the details, uh, as we said, uh, the tap capacitor resonator, again, can act reliably like a, a, a transformer. The minimum required transconductance for this circuit to oscillate is shown here. The oscillation frequency is equal to one over the square root of L P times the series combination of these two transistors, as which is shown here. Okay, so this is called our cold piece oscillator, obviously. Another uh, very widely used oscillator uh, is what we call cross coupler oscillator. But how can we implement the cross coupler oscillator using the concept that we just started with? Uh, again, we start with this uh, positive feedback, unity gain positive feedback. And in place of H of, H of, H of S is this uh, uh, couple of uh, single tuned common source amplifiers in the uh, feedback configuration. So in other words, H of S is replaced by these uh, two uh, common source uh, single tuned amplifiers in cascade. 
Now, redrawing this circuit uh, will lead us to the famous cross coupling pair oscillator. And we know that uh, the, for the famous, for this cross coupling pair oscillator, obviously these two nodes are oscillating differentially, producing differential voltage. And the minimum required gain for oscillation uh, is easily obtained. Uh, in fact, the minimum transconductance is equal, is equal to one over uh, the resistor, the conductance of this transistor, the loss of the inductor, and the oscillation frequency is simply ob obtained by the resonant frequency of each uh, RLC tank circuit, assuming that these LC tank circuits are identically matched. Okay, so, but you know, uh, the presentation here is revolving around millimeter wave, right? So the question is that, uh, can I use uh, this cross coupled parallel LC oscillator at high side of the millimeter wave frequency range? Let's assume that I want to design this, redesign or consider this LC oscillator for frequencies around like 150 gigahertz, uh, close to F max, um, possibly above, uh, uh, above half F max. Uh, can I use this uh, simple cross coupled pair for those frequencies? In order to answer the question, uh, let's first uh, look at the uh, driving point impedance of this cross coupled pair. And to understand and appreciate what is going on, of course, we can use a small signal model. And uh, the small signal model of this cross coupled pair uh, is shown here. Without going through the details, the driving point admittance uh, of the, the contributed by this cross coupled pair is shown here. And the, the real part, of this transconductance, ignoring channel length modulation is minus GM, GM over two, whereas its reactive part is totally capacitive. And in fact, this capacitor could be very big. Uh, if you look at it, uh, CGD, the overlap gain to, drain, uh, gain to drain capacitance contributes quite significantly to overall capacitance. That might not be a good news for FinFET technologies, for example, where CGD constitutes a big proportion of the overall capacitance. And therefore, it means that if uh, this oscillator is going to be used at very high frequencies, and also if you want to design this LC oscillator at very high frequencies using advanced FinFET technology, then we are running into some problem when it comes to parasitics. Not only that, but also the driving point conductance of this circuit, which is roughly equal to minus GM over 2, cannot be made sufficiently large to compensate for large losses at millimeter wave frequencies. What are those losses? For example, a skin effect dependent uh, loss of the inductor, the loss of the capacitors. And all these losses, which by the, by the way, uh, exacerbate, get exacerbated at a high, very high frequencies, uh, cannot be simply uh, uh, compensated for minus G, by minus GM over two. And aside from this, the transconductance of the transistor at very high frequencies is also degraded. So we have to find a way to empower this transconductance. To have to find a way to, in fact, increase the negative conductance being used to uh, compensate for the existing loss of the circuit. So what are the ways uh, to do that? Um, of course, one uh, there, are, there might be many, many possible ways to uh, do that. But one interesting way that I would like to share with you is shown here. So in order to kind of Im improve the negative conductance or increase the negative conductance at very high frequencies, one possible idea is to interject negative resistor as the source degeneration load of this cross coupling pair, right? So uh, let's then go through the circuit and study the circuit and find out how this uh, pair of so, uh, source degenerated negative resistors are. Uh, helping this cross coupler pair to increase the effective transconductance. So uh, I would like to uh, kind of, again, go back to this circuit, again, source degenerated negative resistor. If, you, if we try to derive the real part of input impedance, input admittance of this circuit, you see that the real part is equal to minus GM of this uh, uh, transistor pair over two times one minus GMRS, and obviously, uh, depending on the bias current and the resistance value, we can make this, in fact, larger than uh, the absolute value of this, much, uh, much larger than GM over 2. Uh, in fact, we can create a more negative conductance uh, using, this, uh, using this circuit. But of course, there is no such negative conductance in practice. We have to find a way, find a device that can replace or can realize this negative conductance. And uh, as you can guess, a negative conductance can be realized using a transistor. When we talk about transistor, 
immediately we have to include the parasitic capacitors. So therefore, a more realistic uh, component, which is, should be placed as the source degeneration load uh, of this cross copper pair is comprised of this parallel RC circuit, where these capacitors are modeling the parasitic capacitance of the device. And uh, if we put the, as soon as we put the capacitor here, then we see that the maximum operation frequency of this cross couple pair is degraded by these capacitors because we are at, at kind of adding more parasitic capacitor to the device. Now to mitigate this, uh, one way is to add an inductor to partially resonate out the capacitors. And if we do that, then possibly we can uh, maintain the maximum oscillation frequency of this cross couple pair. Now, um, we basically took halfway to the uh, full circuit realization of this circuit. From here, uh, you can guess that uh, a circuit uh, composite cell that can replace this parallel RC circuit here is uh, another cross coupler pair that, is, uh, that can be placed uh, underneath the main uh, core cross coupler pair with that inductor that is used to partially resonate out the effects of the capacitors. So the full circuit, uh, which we call, which we called uh, double cross coupler pair. Uh, topology is shown here, where we have the inductor again. These inductors are used again to partially resonate, uh, resonate out the uh, capacitor sitting here and here. And then we have our core cross, cross couple pair. And this circuit with this uh, LO, um, this uh, VCO, and in fact, uh, this is a VCO, was designed for, a, for our 210 gigahertz fundamental frequency transmitter. And uh, the uh, phase noise of this oscillator was around minus uh, 82. Uh, dB per hertz and Momegar's offset. For more information, interested read, uh, viewers can take a look at our paper, which was published in Journal of Solid State Circuit, March 2014, which was an extension of an ISSCC paper in 2013, which was presented. And uh, you can uh, kind of uh, go to, uh, in this paper, uh, great de uh, details have been spent to describe an op uh, the operation of this circuit. So one way of then uh, improving perhaps the uh, operation of the uh, oscillator at very high frequencies is to increase the negative conductance. And one way of increasing negative conductance is shown here. Now, uh, when it comes to the frequency tuning, which is another uh, performance metric for oscillator, uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, the basic oscillators, the way that uh, the basic VCO, LC VCOs we learn uh, is primarily based on the varactor. Um, and Let's uh, kind of start by uh, stating a very important fact here. Uh, parasitic capacitors dominate the total capacitance and degrade the tuning range of the oscillators with varactor tuning. Even more importantly, varactors at high frequencies have low quality factors. Uh, in fact, a typical varactor at uh, frequencies above 100 gigahertz can have a quality factor around two to five compared to, for example, the quality factor of an inductor at this frequency, which could be as high as 20. So if then uh, the message here is that uh, absence of any kind of loss compensation mechanism, if we use a varactor-based LCVCOs at very high frequencies, then we are running into the problem of not having a sufficient output power and uh, excessively high phase noise for this oscillator. So then what can we do about this? How can we resolve this fundamental problem? In this pre presentation, I'm going to go through two effective techniques. One is uh, varactor loss compensation mechanism or techniques, which I'm going to explain later on. But immediately right now, I'm going to discuss another technique in order to introduce tuning, which is that rather than uh, kind of having capacitor as uh, varying with the voltage, let's assume that the inductor is a com component that is independent for dependent on a current by changing the current, we change the inductor, and as a result, we can vary the uh, oscillation frequency. In other words, rather than having a varactor based tuning, let's look at the inductive tuning and let's look at the pros and cons of an inductive tuning. I would like to make a case that perhaps inductive tuning, tuning at high frequencies, very high frequencies, close to beyond, F, uh, beyond 100 gigahertz, might be a better circuit candidate compared to a varactor based tuning. But why? Uh, so as we know that uh, it is obviously a fact that as oscillation frequency increases towards soft terahertz band, the inductor size will uh, decrease almost quadratically. 
So, uh, for example, 100 gigahertz uh, center frequency, oscillation frequency uh, for, uh, in, for an LC oscillator oscillating at an oscillation frequency of around like 100 gigahertz or above uh, can have an inductant, an inductor as a small as few hundred picohenry. And the Q factors as high as 15 to 20 for a small size inductor as much as few hundreds of picohenry is quite possible in silicon technologies. Another important notion here is that uh, not only the inductor sizes become uh, smaller and the quality factor of this small size inductor are good around like 15 to 20 inside uh, silicon technologies uh, for, for a monolithic inductor. Then another important fact here is that magnetic coupling between two mutually coupled inductors with coupling coefficient of 0.6 or more can be achieved inside, inside the silicon. So I'm using these two important notion in order to kind of make my way out to implement, uh, uh, to kind of implement or realize an inductive tuning mechanism for an LC oscillator. So um, how can I do that? So I would like to draw your attention to this particular circuit. This circuit is very simple circuit. Uh, by the way, I'm using an HPT, a pair of HPT. You can easily use a pair of CMOS transistors. So CMOS devices, doesn't matter. So we have a transistor and this transistor at its gate or the base in this case, we have a parallel RL circuit. Both sides of these circuits are terminated at least the, the input to a, to a series or I'm sorry, the series RL circuit and the uh, emitters are uh, biased using this tail current. So uh, why am I using this uh, or employing this R and L at the base terminal of this transistor? Uh, let's go back to our basic knowledge of electronic circuits. We know that, uh, first of all, adding an inductor in series with the base terminal of this uh, uh, HPT or a gate terminal of a MOS transistor can introduce a negative resistance. On the other hand, adding a resistor at the base terminal of a transistor or a gate of a MOS transistor can introduce inductance, active inductance. This is what we call active inductance. And good news here is that this resistor together with this transistor um, introduces a current dependent active inductor. So I'm using these two important observations together, hand in hand together to implement a high quality factor active inductor. Why do I say high quality factor active inductor? Because again, this resistor together with the transistor is used to realize an active inductor and the inductor itself in series with the gate or base is used to introduce negative resistor. So you can imagine that if there is a loss or the resistor in our circuit model, that resistor is possibly compensated partially by a negative resistor contributed by uh, the inductor. And as you can see, these uh, equations clearly show that for example, when it comes to the negative resistor, LBB, this term introduces a negative resistance. And we can adjust LBB such that the negative conductance, the, the real part of Z in becomes very small. And also here, if you look at it, GM34, this term is directly contributing, and so is this term, is directly contributing to the active inductance. And by changing the current, uh, likewise, by changing the transconductance, I can change the inductor. Now, um, Shown here are uh, simulated examples of uh, how, what kind of tuning I can get out of this active inductor. This active inductor for uh, uh, at uh, resonant frequency of 100 gigahertz for uh, a series inductance of 60 picohenry for three different values of uh, series resistor. You can see that uh, as we change the current, the inductor is uh, uh, changing rather um, substantially. And the quality factor, interestingly, as the current increases, the quality factor in, uh, increases. And you can see that this quality factor will increase further as we increase our LBB, as we increase the series uh, inductor, simply because the series inductor, as I mentioned, introduces a negative resistor here. And that negative resistor compensates for existing losses, thereby increasing or improving the quality factor. OK. so. Uh, this core part of the circuit that uh, I'm showing here, uh, in here and here, are, are responsible for uh, current variant inductance, right, or active inductance. Now, how can I use this active inductance in my oscillator, right? In order to do this, uh, I try. I use exist. Uh, I use the notion of magnetic coupling to couple whatever inductor I have here and here, whatever inductance 
uh, active inductance, variable active inductance that I can generate using this pair of circuit composite cell and um, magnetically couple it to the core oscillator. And in order to do this, I'm using a, a transformer in order to couple the effect of the uh, primary side of the transformer to the secondary side. Unfortunately, by adding this uh, magnetic coupling mechanism to couple or induce inductive coupling to the core oscillator, which I haven't shown here yet, uh, the variable inductor, the tuning range of the inductance obviously is compromised because then there is a constant inductor which is effectively added to this variable inductor, thereby reducing the tuning range. But again, still the tuning range is there. We can achieve like four to 5% tuning range at very high frequencies. Now putting this, uh, all this together, shown here is the complete example of a voltage control oscillator, varactorless voltage control oscillator with inductive tuning. Uh, on the on the side, you see this pair that I used here, T3 and T4, with this RL-based degeneration uh, load that are responsible to produce active inductance. The active inductance using this uh, transformer coupling is directly coupled to the main inductor, and shown in the middle is a differential clap or you can say cold piece modified cold piece oscillator uh, and the main oscillation uh, frequency is obviously determined using this pair and this pair and in order to further increase the frequency i put together this vco in a push push configuration meaning that i basically take this side and this side and short wire them together and then um, get this uh, oscillation from this node. And as we can see, using a push-push push configuration, I can uh, achieve twice the frequency of the oscillation, or I can acquire twice the oscillation frequency of the core oscillator. So again, we are basically using this uh, uh, active inductance in order to introduce the inductive tuning. We are basically using a magnetic coupling to uh, induce this magnetic, this indu active, uh, active inductance or uh, variable inductance directly to the core oscillator. And then we are using a clap oscillator in order to uh, design my uh, oscillator. And I'm using a push-push configuration in order to uh, emphasize or uh, extract the second harmonic. Uh, this oscillator, by the way, uh, was uh, designated for a frequency of 200 gigahertz, 0.2 terahertz. And uh, in fact, the chip was fabricated. In this presentation, I'm not going to show uh, measurement results uh, per se, uh, because uh, this presentation, this seminar is intended for education. But uh, just in order to prove uh, my case that, in fact, using uh, only inductive tuning without any varactor, uh, how can we achieve tuning range? The measurement results at, at, at least show uh, a 3.5% tuning range from 198 to 205 gigahertz uh, with a very good phase noise of around minus 86 dBc per hertz at one megahertz offset and with a very good power efficiency. And this basically, and then uh, as we can see, the output power remains constant, almost constant across the tuning range, which is one of the positive, at another positive attribute of this circuit. So, so far we discussed the inductive tuning as one way of mitigating the problem that we have regarding reactor tuning. Now, imagine that uh, then, you know, inductive tuning is obviously, obviously one way. Uh, another way is just go back to the reactor tuning and try to find out some kind of loss compensation mechanism in order to compensate for existing loss of the reactor. And in order to appreciate how we can do this, let's go back to our original cross couple pair oscillator, uh, which are uh, employing, which is employing a pair of MOS reactors here. And here I'm basically using, uh, uh, at least ideally, I would like to use a loss compensation mechanism uh, producing negative resistor. And this negative resistor possibly compensate for existing loss of this reactor. Okay. So the reactor's Q is obviously too low at very high frequencies. And we would like to see what kind of uh, loss compensation network I can use, um, like this, for example, ideally, or in abstract mode, uh, in order to compensate for the loss of the reactor. But unfortunately, there are a number of problems. So negative resistor is all, when we talk about negative resistor, always what immediately comes to mind is transistor as an active device. So if I want to use a transistor to implement a negative resistor, another problem comes to the picture, which is the existence of all these parasitics, parasitic capacitor, and in fact, the loss associated with the transistor and what have you. So the parasitic capacitors associated with the loss compensation network degrade the tuning range. So uh, therefore, it defies the very 
the very intention that we had. We wanted to increase the tuning range. We want to improve also the phase noise. But as a result of using this loss compensation mechanism, because of the existing parasitics, uh, the phase noise and the tuning range will be degraded. So what can we do about this? Consider this. How about placing this loss compensation mechanism away from the node of interest? What are the node of interest? The node of interest is perhaps the output terminal for which we want to get oscillation. What, what do I mean that, by that? I mean, for example, ex still use this loss compensation network, but place it somewhere else. Of course, in this uh, very simple cross copper privacy oscillator, we cannot think of any other place but this place <laughs> to in, in order to do the loss compensation mechanism, to provide or to insert this loss compensation network. But let's uh, kind of look at a more complicated circuit. Imagine that we have a ring oscillator and shown here, for example, a four stage ring oscillator. I'm showing it here. If you follow my laser pointer, you see that there is this ring oscillator. And this ring oscillator has uh, a varactor here. Uh, so we have uh, four varactors connected to the input of uh, each delay stage. And then I'm also inserting a loss compensation network right in parallel with this varactor. So this is my main ring oscillator. So the main ring uh, possibly oscillates at omega zero. But what I'm going to do here is that since each delay stage incorporates a transistor, and the transistor is a nonlinear device, what I can do is that I can basically uh, take a harmonic of this transistor. In this case, for example, in this particular case, since we are looking at a four stage ring, I'm interested in extracting the fourth harmonic of this uh, oscillation circuit, uh, oscillation waveform. So the transistor uh, extracting the fourth harmonic here, 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 and here, and guiding this fourth harmonic to the common node and observe this node as the node of interest. So if I do that, then possibly, and if I use, uh, for example, some notch filters or traps um, placed at nth of uh, frequency, I basically disallow this nth harmonic, in this case, fourth harmonic, I, I disallow or prevent the fourth harmonic to inject back to the main loop. So the main loop is oscillating at omega zero, I am creating fourth harmonic using the nonlinearity of the devices inside these delay stages. And then I guide this nonlinear harmonics, in this case, in this particular case, for example, fourth harmonic to a common node, extract the oscillation here at fourth the frequency, four times the frequency. And then yet I try to protect the node here, the oscillation here, from parasitics of the oscillator. So, for example, if we want to design a like 200 gigahertz frequency. I can design this oscillation, uh, the main oscillator to be oscillating at 50 gigahertz frequency. I can introduce a loss compensation mechanism right in parallel with this wire actor, not worrying about affecting the main oscillation because the main oscillation would be at fourth harmonic at 200 gigahertz. And this 200 gigahertz is derived from here. So this is one way of doing this. And in fact, I'm uh, one example, uh, another example, another realistic example of doing this is shown here. So shown here, rather than having like four stage ring, uh, consider a three stage ring oscillator. So we have a three stage ring oscillator, one, two, three, one, two, and three. And then we are using our varactor, but this varactor is, uh, I call it an active varactor. So we have an active varactor here, here, and here sitting at the input node, very similar to this one. Imagine that each uh, delay stage here is replaced by a single transistor. So I had my varactor here. So I have my active varactor sitting here here and here. And then this oscillator, uh, which is uh, basically this loop, is oscillating at a fundamental frequency. And I take third harmonic, extract the third harmonic. I guide the third harmonic of these transistors up using these branches and also using uh, the filters here, preventing the third harmonic to leak back to the main loop. And then by guiding this third harmonic, I, uh, the, all these third harmonics will be emerging at this node, uh, at this node, and then I would be able to get the third harmonic. Now the question is that how can I design this active varactor? And one way of uh, designing the active varactor is shown here. Uh, what I call 
a codepiece based active actor. So we have the active actor here. We have a codepiece uh, um, device. We know that from the input of the codepiece device, we see uh, an, a capacitor, a capacitor here, and a negative resistor. So I basically uh, realize the negative resistor using this culpit based or clap based composite cell and also put the reactor as part of the tap capacitor resonator of this uh, culpit cell in order to introduce tuning. By the way, I, we use this uh, uh, culpit based active reactor inside this ring VCO as part of our uh, frequency 300 gigahertz frequency synthesizer, which I'm going to explain next. So, so far we discussed uh, um, design challenges in uh, oscillators at millimetric frequencies. We at least introduced one candidate that uh, can work at very high frequencies. I went through inductive tuning as an alternative mechanism for uh, tuning at high frequencies. I also introduced uh, an effective loss compensation mechanism that compensates for the reactor loss. Now I'm uh, kind of discussing or I'm going, going through a millimeter wave fundamental frequency PLL based frequency synthesizer that uses uh, this technique in particular, for example, uh, 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 an LCVCO with uh, loss compensation mechanism in order to produce oscillation at very high frequencies. Uh, so, excuse me, Professor, we have a couple of questions. Uh, would this be a good point to cover them? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, Venkata, you had a couple of questions lined up. Uh, I think I have unmuted you. You should be able to ask. Yeah. Um, hi, Professor. Um, I was wondering, uh, could, could you talk about the robustness of these topologies, um, the oscillator topologies, and uh, talk about you know how uh, their performance is uh, uh, varying over PVT? Mm -hmm. So, uh, PVT is an issue always, but uh, you know, uh, PVT is always an issue for uh, any circuits. Of course, the circuit techniques that I introduce here are not an exception. Uh, the PVT variation is uh, partially captured by the tuning range of the VCO. So if I can have relatively good tuning range for the VCO, I can somehow capture the PVT of the VCO, particularly if the VCO is gonna be used for a PLL. Um, so, Therefore, you know, the PVT is not really worse than, for example, a conventional VCO uh, and the techniques that are used in order to capture the PVT mm -hmm. variation are the, almost the same as what we use in the high, high frequencies. Namely, for example, you have a void enough tuning range to capture the PVT. When it comes to the robustness, robustness is uh, perhaps can be defined in the context of VCO as the uh, phase noise, for example, right? Or being able to uh, introduce, yes. uh, to generate high enough output power. So the phase noise, uh, at least these techniques, I showed that inductive tuning, uh, since uh, the inductive tuning uses inductors and inductors at high frequencies have higher Q compared to varactor counterparts, then uh, naturally the phase noise that you can get out of the inductively tuned uh, LCVCO is, high, is better. And that means that uh, if the robustness is defined in the context of low phase noise, then of course, uh, one can argue that inductively tuned LCVCO can outperform an, uh, a varactor based LCVCO at high frequencies. Uh, when I say high frequency, I would say yeah. above 100 gigahertz near uh, max. Yes. Yeah, yeah, got it. Other questions? Okay, so um, here I would like to uh, kind of go through a design of uh, a fundamental frequency integer N frequency synthesizer that we designed a couple of years ago, several years ago. And I'm gonna go through a number of techniques that we use in this uh, uh, phase lock loop to achieve a 300 gigahertz frequency. In fact, I want, to, I want to show that in silicon technologies, it is in fact possible to design relatively low phase noise, uh, high performance PLL with relatively good output power. Uh, in silicon technologies using uh, some novel circuit techniques. So uh, the loop of the PLL is shown here. As I said, it's an integer N PLL. The synthesizer employs a third order loop filter, a triple push VCO, which I already introduced, but I'm gonna go through this a little bit more. And then uh, we have a divide by four uh, frequency divider here. And this divide by four frequency divider is co-designed and co-optimized with the VCO. And I will explain what do I mean by co-optimizing this divider 
together with this VCO. I'm going to explain more. The co-optimization and co-design, as you will see, will be done at both the circuit design level and the layout level. And then uh, at the output of this divide by four frequency, we have this uh, uh, our famous divider chain that divide the frequency all the way down to uh, lower frequency. So overall, we uh, uh, wanted to do a divide by 1024 in order to bring down the frequency to the uh, crystal oscillator that we use as an, as an off chip uh, signal source for this uh, frequency synthesizer. So the fundamental frequency of the VCO is 300 gigahertz. I'm using third harmonic uh, within this VCO in order to synthesize a 300 gigahertz frequency. And as you can see, I'm using a three phase injection. Look at this, a three phase injection in order to connect the VCO to the next subsequent divide by four frequency divider. Okay, so in order to increase the output power, we are using uh, a technique that has been used by the prior work uh, in order to achieve the maximum output power. It was shown by the prior work that uh, if we consider a device here, uh, like for example, a transistor, and uh, you try to kind of calculate or derive the overall power, the, uh, re the reactive power here, PG, is dependent on uh, the forward gain and the reverse gain, as you can see, and its phase. So what it means here is that the power, the reactive power here, uh, depending on the phase shift of uh, this uh, Y12 plus Y21 of this two port network can be, can vary, right? And this optimum, phase, in, in other words, there is an optimum phase shift that can lead to the maximum PG. So what does it mean? It means that if I want to get the maximum auto power out of a single device, I have to make sure that there is a certain phase relationship between the input, for example, in this case, base, and the output, in this case, collector of this device. And if there is a certain phase shift, then I can achieve the maximum uh, auto power for this single device. So this is really a knowledge that was gained by a prior work paper published in Journal of Solid State Circuit 2011. We are using this uh, kind of notion in order to design uh, a high power uh, ring oscillator. So remember that we want to design a 300 gigahertz ring oscillator. And uh, one way of uh, achieving this uh, 300 gigahertz oscillation is, as I said, by, using, uh, by designing the oscillator at lower frequencies and using a higher harmonic in order to uh, achieve a 300 gigahertz frequency. For example, uh, th three candidates come to mind. The first candidate is comprising a two-stage ring. The uh, second can candidate is comprising the three-stage ring. And the uh, third candidate is uh, using a four-stage ring. And if you notice, uh, in case you notice, I'm also using intentionally using a series phase shift between the output of one stage to the next. Output of one stage to the next. OK. so. Uh, if, you want, if you want to use a two-stage ring in order to design 300 gigahertz frequency, this two-stage ring can be uh, operating as a push-push oscillator, right? Uh, in other words, I can get the common note here, and uh, the, a strong second harmonic can appear here, and I can basically extract the second harmonic in order to achieve 300 gigahertz. And if that's the case, then this fundamental two-stage ring oscillator should be designed to oscillate at 150 gigahertz frequency. Okay, and in order to achieve the maximum output power, let's go back here at 150 gigahertz frequency, if I'm using this device at 150 gigahertz frequency, in order to achieve the maximum output power, get the maximum output power out of one single device, the phase required phase shift should be around 115 degrees, right? So 150 degrees excess phase shift from the input to output of each transistor is needed in order to achieve the maximum output power. If I'm using three stage ring, of course, the main ring should oscillate at 100 gigahertz. In this case, again, if you go back and look at uh, uh, 100 gigahertz, at 100 gigahertz, the, ex, uh, the excess phase shift required to get maximum auto power is around 130 degrees. And uh, also so on and so forth. Like for example, for four stage, uh, the main stage, the main ring uh, core should oscillate at uh, 75 gigahertz and the phase shift should be, excess phase shift is around 145 degrees. But again, as uh, without using this excess phase shift, of course, we know that the uh, phase shift from uh, input to the output is around 180 degrees, right? So therefore, to achieve the 115 degrees uh, optimum phase shift, we have to introduce yet additional 65 degrees in order to make sure that the phase shift between these two is remaining at 115 degrees, right? Uh, likewise here, so for a three-stage ring, 
the uh, uh, oscillation frequency, the phase shift uh, normally in the absence of this uh, theta, the phase shift between input and output of the device is around 120 degrees. Here, the optimum phase shift is 130 degrees. So we need, we require to have additional 10 degree phase shift in order to get to this optimum phase shift. And this 10 degree is realized using these excess phase shifters and that are placed between the output and input of each stage and so on and so forth. So, uh, but if you compare these three candidates, of course, uh, it seems that the um, uh, three stage ring would be a more viable candidate for uh, this 300 gigahertz oscillator simply because the excess phase shift required in this here uh, as part of the ring oscillator is less. And obviously the uh, lower phase shift means that the loss of the components, passive components used to realize this excess phase shift would be less. So we ended up using a three stage ring in order to achieve this 200 gigahertz frequency. And that basically takes us to this oscillator circuit that I already explained. Uh, so we have a three stage ring oscillator, as I mentioned, we have, you're using this cold piece based active reactor uh, with loss compensation mechanism inside it in order to uh, create or introduce tuning, yet be able to uh, compensate for the loss of the reactor. And uh, again, uh, I would like to remind you that this main ring oscillator is uh, oscillating at 100 gigahertz frequency. So the third harmonic is guided to the, out to, to, to the output, is emerging here at the common node producing this 300 gigahertz frequency. Now, uh, in order to disallow the uh, third harmonic to go back and leak back to the main ring stage, we basically try to design the circuit such that the whole circuit here, the whole passive circuit from the output of each stage to the input of the next stage acts like a notch or trap filter at the third harmonic. So in other words, at the third harmonic, this node is short, this allowing the third harmonic to revolving around the loop. So the third harmonic finds no way but to go up and emerge at this node in order to produce the third harmonic. So this is a trick we use in order to guide the third harmonic only up and disallowing the third harmonic to go back to the main ring. So the divider loop also is very interesting. We are using a three-phase three divider loop with multi-injection in order to kind of design this divide, divide by four frequency divider. So the principle is very simple. We are using three injection, uh, like a three uh, phase uh, locking injection. Uh, as part of a ring, another ring, in order to design a divider loop. I'm not, I'm not going to go through the details because it is very straightforward. And one way of designing this injection lock frequency divider is shown here. Uh, so again, the inputs are coming from the, the inputs B1, B2, and B3 are coming from the oscillator. B1, B2, and B3 are coming from the output of the uh, cold piece space active reactor of the main oscillator injected to the input of the transistor. The transistor produces the uh, third or the, the one fourth of the harmonic, the one fourth will be flow, uh, flowing through the main loop and also the same thing. We wanna make sure that the third harmonic doesn't go back uh, to the main loop. And as a result, by using this technique, by using this circuit, we can produce uh, or we can design a multi-injection divide by four frequency divider. For more information about the circuit operation, I would like to refer you to our Journal of Solid State Circuit, which was published in 2014. Uh, now, Professor, can we take another break? I think we have a few more questions. But uh, before we go to the questions, just want to remind our participants, we had to disable the chat because of the trouble we were having earlier. Mm -hmm. So if you have any questions, just hit reply to the email uh, that I sent from Eventbrite earlier, uh, which had the links, the Zoom link for this meeting. So it says no, no reply, but then you can just hit reply to that email and it will send uh, your questions to me. So if you have any questions, just reply to the uh, email with the Zoom links that you received before the meeting. Uh, Venkata, you have, uh, I think we have a few more questions, right? So go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, hi, Professor. So. <clears throat> Um, I'm wondering, you know, when we uh, go to advanced nodes uh, as the technology evolves and the gate length shrinks, I mean, what are the challenges uh, in the oscillator design? Are you going to talk about those points as well? Uh, not really, but, uh, you know, uh, designing oscillators in advanced, advanced nodes, like, for example, FinPet technologies, uh, this uh, presentation doesn't cover that, but if there's a specific question, I would be happy to answer the questions. If there's uh, a the question. Yes. Go yeah. Ahead. The, the, the question is like, you know, are there any limitations in terms of uh, 
um, like how many transistors can we stack or, or uh, exactly. yeah. So the main challenge is the parasitics. And the fact uh, that, for example, the gate drain overlap capacitance of the device is no longer a, a tiny portion of the overall parasitic capacitance. What does it mean? It means that, for example, if you want to design an LNA, if you want to design an oscillator, then you have to account for the CGD of the transistors. You cannot ignore it. And of course, we, uh, for LNA, we know what happens. CGD for LNA may create some kind of un conditional stability problem or instability problem. For the oscillators, it creates a drift from the main oscillation. And the drift, uh, uh, if it's not captured, then creates some problem. And also, it adds to the phase noise degradation. So these are some of the things that most notably for, uh, in terms of uh, parasitic capacitance and uh, their uh, impact on the oscillation, fre uh, oscillation frequency at high frequencies and advanced CMOS technology can, uh, can, can come to the picture. So in, in general, FinFET transistors, while they are very good for a digital implementation uh, due to the fact that uh, the uh, parasitics at very high frequencies, particularly the unwanted parasitic CGD, most notably, would be uh, substantial compared to the overall capacitance, then that may create some problem for oscillate, uh, very high frequency oscillators in FinFET uh, technologies. Oh, got it. So the, C the CGD is a problem. How about like, you know, as we advance through the uh, technology, we, we have higher FT and F max, right? So that's, that's yeah. an, an advantage in terms of the oscillation frequency, no, correct? Not necessarily. I, uh, this is really, this point is uh, highly disputed. So the, oscillate, the maximum oscillation frequency, operation frequency of the device, unfortunately, will not scale up with the same scaling factor as the uh, device feature size. In other words, going from like uh, 45 nanometer all the way to seven nanometer, we, can, uh, we cannot hope that the F max of the device all of a sudden goes to like 500, 600 gigahertz. In fact, uh, the maximum operation frequency uh, turns out to be saturated uh, to uh, around like 350 gigahertz for uh, FinFET technology. What I'm trying to say here is that advanced processes are not really uh, leading to uh, outrageously higher F max of the device. And that's the problem. That's the reason that a number of techniques have been used, like for example, using harmonics of the main oscillation frequency, like the way I just did it here, in order to design high frequency oscillation. Advanced technology nodes, in other words, cannot really help uh, design fundamental frequency oscillators at very, very high frequencies, simply because the uh, F max of the design of, of the process is not really scaled, unfortunately. Got it. Thank you. So we have a couple more questions from the email uh, channel. So I think this next question has to do with one of your earlier slides. Uh, uh, doesn't large RBB greater than 20 ohms at the gates of the transistors significantly degrade the phase noise performance? And if, and the second related question is, and if such a, such a large RBB is in the signal path, then won't it kill the oscillation? First of all, the R R RBB is not in the signal path. So look at this, RBB is away from the signal path. RBB is just used to introduce tuning and the signal path is here. So the large RBB, there is a point about the phase noise. Uh, so let's look, let's analyze this, right? So large RBB, so RBB, in fact, introduces this uh, active inductance, right? And uh, also, if we increase RBB, it means that the noise of RBB, input referred noise of the RBB, will decrease. So it's not really clear uh, if increasing, or of course, you don't want to increase RBB to kilo ohm range. Look at the range of the values for RBB, 15 ohm, 20 ohm, 25 ohm, simply because we are using RBB to implement or realize that active inductance, right? Let's go back here. We are basically using this RBB in order to generate this active inductance here, right? Look at that. So therefore, if I'm not really using, uh, if I increase RBB so much, then the active inductance value will increase. And that means that then the frequency of oscill the oscillation, this is not really good for that desired oscillation frequency, which we are, uh, which we intend to use, right? So therefore RBB should be chosen in regard to the relative inductance that we want to use here. Like for example, in uh, for a, a 200 gigahertz frequency or 100 gigahertz core frequency, look at the effective inductor range that we are looking at around like 80 picohenry all the way down to 40 picohenry. Uh, it's the inductance value is not that big because we are operating at very high frequencies. Therefore, RBB uh, also accordingly should not be very big. 
And therefore, the phase noise contribution is not much, particularly if you consider that RBB is away from the signal path and doesn't contribute to the output power degradation. Uh, okay, next question has to do with the later slides. <laughs> How sensitive are these architectures to the matching between all those passive components? I guess this has to do with the slide prior to the one that you're showing now. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the question is uh, how sensitive is the uh, the architecture to the matching, considering all the passive components. Yeah. Okay. So matching here, the way that I, we use matching here is to generate uh, to real to satisfy a number of operations or operation functions that we intended for. Like for example, in this case, if you look at this LVB and this uh, resistor, these two are used to realize that ten degree phase shift. Remember this 10 degree phase shift that we need in order to arrive at the, at the optimum phase shift for the maximum output power. So these inductors and capacitors in this particular ring stage oscillator are intended for um, acquiring the required excess phase shift. And also in this case, for example, creating a trap at uh, third harmonic, right? So uh, therefore, if you say matching circuit, you have to uh, kind of, you have to be careful about this. So the matching circuit in this case is used for a particular purpose to achieve a certain phase shift for the purpose of maximizing output power and also to create some kind of filtering mechanism or like a trap at some certain frequency. And that itself is designed in a way to satisfy these two purposes for this particular case. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, can you please illustrate how we got three FO by connecting the three inductors? Mm -hmm. So uh, we get the third harmonic. So the three, the 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 trick behind this three FO is really lies uh, on the nonlinearity of the transistor. The transistor third or order nonlinearity is is used to produce the third harmonic. Now the third harmonic is picked up by the inductors LC tuned at three hundred gigahertz frequency. So LC. Uh, as uh, I will show the layout and hopefully you will appreciate it. So LC length, the length of these micro strip lines are chosen together with the cap capacitors sitting at the output, for example, such that the uh, so-called tank frequency, uh, resonance frequency here and here and here uh, are tuned at uh, 300 gigahertz frequency. But the main culprit behind the third harmonic is really the non-linear of the transistor. So the non-linear of the transistor is mainly responsible to uh, produce the third harmonic. But to extract it, of course, you have to make sure that LC length and the capacitance values are chosen such that they tune at the three, at 300 gigahertz frequency. If that's the question, uh, I, can, I can elaborate more if uh, there is a doubt here. Uh, so uh, the speaker who, the, the audience member who asked the question, uh, if, if that answers your question, fine. If not, just send me another email okay. and we'll pass that on to well, the I think it's very clear. The third order nonlinearity is, due, uh, is uh, uh, kind of you use a transitional linearity in order to produce the third harmonic and the third harmonic is tuned using this LC and the capacitor here. But how can we adjust LC? Let's go back to the layout. So the layout is really kind of, um, you can say this is an art piece, honestly, uh, to design the layout of this oscillator together with the uh, divider. So but remember at the beginning of this part of the presentation, I said we are co-optimizing or co-designing the oscillator together with the divider. So what I mean by co-designing and co-optimizing is shown here. So uh, shown here, uh, we can basically distinguish three or two possible loops. This loop that is indicated in like um, gray color. And then we have the inner loop and we have this kind of middle node or a middle node here, which is uh, supposed to extract the third harmonic, right? So the outer loop, is responsible for realizing all these transmission lines that are used for the injection lock divided by four frequency divider. So this is the order loop. And the resemblance of topology between the frequency divider, look at the frequency divider topology, and look at the oscillator topology. So they are in shape and topology, uh, in, in topology uh, are extremely similar. So I'm using this kind of, uh, uh, topological similarity in order to design the layout such that uh, I can basically kind of co-design these two together. Again, the order loop real together with the transistor realizes the 
frequency divider, the inner loop here is uh, designing this uh, three stage ring oscillator. If you look at it, the output coming, connecting, uh, connecting this uh, inner loop to the outer loop is this uh, cold piece space active barrector, cold piece space active barrector here and here and here. And then the inner loop, there are, look at this, there are definitely micro strip lines in the layout. And I didn't show the layout here. If you, uh, I would like to refer you to the Journal of the State Circuit paper. Uh, we have a blow up version of the dye photo. And you can see that there are like three lines literally inside the chip that are coming out of the transistors. These lines here are chosen, the length of these lines are chosen such that together with the pad in the middle, they oscillate or uh, I'm sorry, they resonate at uh, three of zero. The main oscillation frequency, again, the length of the transmission line here, 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 and here, are chosen such that we achieve the required 10 degree excess phase shift that I uh, earlier explained, and also required trap on uh, filter at the third harmonic. The, uh, if you look at, again, uh, for example, the barrector, uh, the active barrectors here, they are connecting the uh, inner loop to the outer loop that is used for the divider. So in other words, the divide by four frequency divider shown here, the main three stage ring oscillator shown here uh, are co-designed together and co-optimized. And if we do that, then it, uh, according to our measurement, we, uh, we were able to achieve very, very good phase noise and output power by co-designing everything holistically, uh, the divide by four and the oscillator together holistically and treat it as a one single block uh, in the layout to optimize the circuit performance. Okay, so I can stop here, guys, uh, or I can continue. It depends on the time. The third, the fourth topic that I'm going to talk about is uh, kind of a little bit more sophisticated multi-port circularly polarized resonator. I would be more than happy to share with you the magnificent theory that my former student, Dr. Nazari, uh, proposed and invented and explored. Uh, so it's an exciting topic. But given the time, I would, I would, uh, I can stop right here, answer any questions that I have uh, that you guys have, or I can continue with the presentation. Uh, so we are good on time, uh, and this talk is being recorded for people to watch later. So if you're okay, then we are okay to continue. Okay. So the fourth uh, topic of this presentation uh, uses a massive amount of knowledge of the EM theory and the physics in order to design a very exciting multiport circularly polarized resonator and radiator. And uh, this design was really kind of envisioned, implemented, and successfully conducted by my former student, Dr. Peyman Nazari, who is right now a senior design engineer at Qualcomm. And I do my best to explain the bits and pieces behind this. You will appreciate the genius uh, design behind this. So the design was uh, presented uh, in 2017 on SSCC and later on was uh, appeared in uh, 2017 issue of Journal of Circuit. Uh, interested Circuit. Uh, interested um, uh, audience can uh, or refer to this paper where we explain the fundamental theory of the multiport oscillators. There is a great deal of theory behind this multiport structure that I'm, I don't have time to go through, but I'm, I'm gonna uh, talk about some of the outcomes of this fundamental theory and leverage this fundamental theory in order to explain this cavity-backed circularly polarized radiator that we designed and fabricated. So again, I'm gonna discuss millimeter wave, circularly polarized, cavity-backed multiport resonator and radiator. First, I would like to start by laying out several strong cases in favor of circular wave polarization. The two figures of this slide indicate the rotation of an exemplary horn antenna around its normal axis and its impact on polarization loss factor, PLF, when it uh, receives a linearly polarized EM wave on the left or on the right when it receives a circularly polarized EM wave. To increase the signal to noise ratio in a line of sight wireless communication, we know that the radiation polarization of the transmitter and the receiver antennas must match one another for maximum detection gain. For linearly polarized uh, uh, antennas, this requires the accurate alignment between the transmitter and receiver antennas. Otherwise, the receiver antenna, as is shown here, cannot efficiently receive the transmitter signal to the extent that the detection gain can, in fact, significantly drop when the polarization of the transmitter and receiver are orthogonal. Look at here, 90 degrees and 270 degrees. Furthermore, for many applications, the transmitted EM wave is subject to random polarization shift. For example, due to a scattering 
after reflection from rough surfaces or propagation through an ionized medium, which is likely to happen in tissue imaging. On the other hand, circularly polarized waves are resilient to such polarization, polarization shifts and misalignments. A design approach, therefore, to co-design a high power, low phase noise oscillator uh, that can produce a, a circularly polarized radiation is vital to achieve high radiative power and high to the DC to EIRP efficiency. So various oscillator topologies, as I mentioned in this presentation, have been examined to provide the optimum voltage gain condition for maximum power generation. While these approaches are able to extract the maximum RF power from a single active device at the frequency of interest, this output property is still far too low to be considered for millimeter wave radiators. To further boost the output power level, power combining schemes are normally used to combine the RF output powers of multiple oscillators, as is shown here. Primarily, this has been achieved by employing either an on-chip power combining network on the right side or multiple antenna elements for constructive power combining in free space that what we call a special power combining shown in the left side. In both methods, however, in addition to power combining networks, a coupling network is mandatory to ensure phase lock oscillation of all constituent oscillator elements. These methods, however, require lossy passive or power hungry active coupling networks, and in fact, buffers to lock the oscillations together, thereby remarkably degrading DC to RF efficiency. So one question then arises, and this question is very fundamental. Is there a way to improve signal generation and radiation efficiency? To address the fundamental weaknesses of the existing power combining network that I just explained right now, we introduce a high efficiency and high power multiport element, which can concurrently perform a multitude of operation. It can concurrently operate as a resonator, as an antenna or radiator, and a power combiner thereby avoiding the lossy coupling networks and antenna buffers. As a result, in our proposed technique, we can inherently create higher radiation power and efficiency. But the question is, can such a structure exist? Moreover, and most importantly, can such multiport structure with multifunction capability that I'm uh, summarizing here is capable of generating circularly polarized radiation? So let's go through some of the design goals that we want to have. So we are seeking a multi-port passive structure. Why? Because we want to have a multi-element signal generation in order to do the power combination. So in order to achieve this multi-element signal generation, we need to have a multi-port structure. Also of particular interest is to generate circularly polarized radiation. And in order to do this, according to our study, we need to come up with the structures with rotational symmetry. And I'm going to give you one example of a structure with rotational symmetry. The third design goal is that, of course, we want to have a high power and low phase noise. And in order to do this, the core resonator, which is used as part of our resonator slash radiator slash power combining, should exhibit high Q. And one structure, high Q structure that is very familiar to microwave designer, microwave designers, is called obviously Mac microwave cavity resonator. The microwave cavity resonator, there is a closed metal structure that confines the EM energy that leads to high Q, high quality factor resonance compared to LC resonator. In fact, the uh, um, dedicated microwave cavity resonator can achieve a quality factor by as much as 10 to the power of six. Also, needless to say that the microwave cavity structures independent separate dedicated microwave cavity structures normally uh, uh, favor symmetric shapes. And that itself, in turn, lead to higher quality factor. OK, as I explained, power hungry millimeter wave antenna buffers and coupling networks degrade the overall efficiency. Therefore, a multiport radiator should be explored that can maximally extract the RF power from the active devices while pro providing proper excitation phases for circularly polarized radiation. In fact, as, is, as I'm showing here, if a rotationally symmetric structure is excited by distinct, evenly spaced phases of an RF signal, so that the overall phase rotation is 360 degree, 
The resulting radiation will be circularly polarized as shown here by this graphical presentation. So in our JSSC 2017 paper, we expanded the theory of multiport oscillator circuits with multiple active devices, exciting a multiport passive structure. Due to the lack of time, unfortunately, I cannot go through the elegant theory of multiport rotationally symmetric oscillators. I would like to refer uh, viewers to our paper published in 2017, Journal of Subject Circuit. Um, based on this theory, we introduced a novel on chip octagonal waveguide uh, cavity back structure that is shown here as part of this multiport radiating element. It is composed of eight symmetric feed ports, eight radiation slots on top of the plate, a hole at the center of the, uh, of the top plate. And I will discuss the purpose of all of these in the next uh, couple of minutes. I will discuss also the cavity. In, the cavity is inherently high quality factor. Uh, and this is, by the way, an on-chip cavity. The structure of, the, of, of chip cavity is extensively discussed in the paper. But um, for viewers who are interested, I can go through the uh, structure, how we laid out this cavity in the, inside the silicon process. It's a very interesting uh, structure. But inherently, this cavity structure can exhibit uh, high quality factor. And this high quality factor can be used to achieve high power and low phase noise resonance. Eight CPW feed lines or feed ports are placed on the periphery of this cavity and are connected to the top plate to excite it, enabling power combining capability within this multiport cavity structure. Oscillation is generated by an eight section loop surrounding this cavity, where each section provides two stages of amplification. This cavity is also part of the resonant network. In fact, this cavity participates directly in determining the oscillation. The loop enforces 45 degree phase difference required for circularly polarized radiation between the cavity adjacent ports. And the cavity combines the power injected to its eight peripheral ports and radiates a circularly polarized signal. Now, the question is why a circularly polarized radiation is guaranteed here? In our paper, in fact, we have proved that uh, a general theory is stating that for an N port passive radiating structure, with rotational symmetry incorporating n rotationally symmetric radiating slots and feed ports, if the feed ports are excited by signals of equal magnitude and constant phase shift of 2 pi over n in general, such a structure will generate circularly polarized radiation along its axis of symmetry, which in this case is z axis here. By exciting the cavity with even a space phases shown here, the eight symmetric slots on top on the top plate radiate a circularly polarized signal without any substrate leakage and the need for silicon lens. The length of the slots control the uh, resonant frequency and thus the frequency of the peak radiation power. Now let's study the cavity excitation under the condition that lead to the city state oscillation. Under this circumstance, namely, in order to have sustainable city state oscillation, the port impedances, driving point impedances, looking at each port, are all, are all should be identical, should all be identical. Z in one equals Z in two equals Z in three, all the way Z in eight, and I call it ZCM. So what is the relationship between these two port impedance, these, uh, these port impedances and the Z parameters of the multiport structure? For a circularly polarized, uh, a circularly symmetric network, we in fact we have proved that the port impedance indicated as Z in K is calculated as the circular convolution of Z parameters and the exponential Fourier basis functions e to the power of j m pi over n. In this case, m is replaced by n minus k. Of particular interest for the purpose of circular polarized radiation of all the possible solutions. And in fact, there are, we can prove that there are eight distinct solutions. There is one solution that leads to the oscillation and also circularly polarized radiation, we have proved that this solution is achieved with a, a phase difference of pi over four. So we have to achieve a phase difference of pi over four. And for this case, if we simulate the driving point impedance of this multiport structure, you see that they are conceived to two resonant frequencies can be conceived among the others that are located at higher frequencies and not shown in this figure. The higher resonant frequency at 116 gigahertz is chosen 
to be the target oscillation frequency as it is, as it coincides with the oscillation of the maximum radiation gain. I'm not going to go through the how why this is the case, but it can be proven that the second resonant frequency coincides with the frequency of the maximum radiation gain, gain which is simulated to be around 1.25 dB. Uh, so the frequency response of the driving point impedance is modeled using a shunt parallel RC, parallel RC tank circuit to gain some intuition about the understanding, uh, to intuition about the operation of the cavity and its impact on the oscillation and sensitivity of the, of the oscillation. And figure shows that the frequency response of this model RC circuit uh, resembles uh, the imaginary and the real part of the cavity structure. And as a result, using this parallel RC tank circuit, we can uh, somehow model the operation of the tank circuit. Look at the quality factor of the structure, which is uh, 38 at 116 gigahertz frequency. Um, in fact, this is a loaded quality factor, and it is a remarkable quality factor uh, for uh, people who are working at frequencies above 100 gigahertz. They appreciate this very high quality factor. Uh, so the loop here. Uh, needs to provide sufficient loop gain and the loop surround this, the surrounding this uh, cavity structure should be able to provide sufficient loop gain for sustainable oscillation. Implying that its port impedance, which I call Y loop M here, Y loop M, uh, which is identical for all ports due to the loop's rotational symmetry needs to provide sufficient negative resistance to cancel the cavity loading impedance, ZCM. In other words, uh, the overall, uh, admittance looking at each node should be summed up to zero. The admittance uh, offered by this multiport structure and an excitation network should be added up to zero in order for uh, this structure to oscillate. So uh, as I said, not only we want to have oscillation, we want to have circularly polarized radiation. And to achieve the circularly polarized radiation, it turns out uh, the phase difference between the adjacent nodes to be should be equal to 45 degrees. And in order to do this, we have to design the matching network of the surrounding circuit. So if you look at the surrounding circuit, it's comprised of a two-stage amplification with matching circuit. And we design the matching circuit such that only at the phase shift of 45 degrees, the real part of the impedance, the overall impedance is negative, and the imaginary part of the is equal to zero for all other modes of operation. In other words, for all other phase shifts other than 45 degrees, we've uh, designed this matching circuit such that the real part of the corresponding admittance is greater than zero. And as a result, the other modes do not have enough power to oscillate. It is observed that this cavity also exhibits a resonant at a very, uh, frequency slightly lower than 150, 116 gigahertz frequency. In fact, this corresponds to the mod oscillation frequency of zero, M0. This results in an unwanted in phase oscillation around the cavity ports. Unfortunately, loop gain for this mode M equals zero cannot be suppressed by matching network. So we have to find another way to kill the in phase oscillation component. Now here comes this hole that my student created right in the middle of the top plate of the cavity. So by adding this uh, uh, hole, we are able to basically suppress the in phase oscillation. And this hole basically kills the undesired in phase oscillation. And therefore, if you use this, then we don't have, we don't see any kind of close uh, oscillation frequency or os the resonance frequency at close, uh, close to the desired frequency. Okay, so on the left side, the Smith chart uh, has been shown. Uh, and simulated Smith chart shows the simulated uh, the, the Smith chart of the overall uh, driving point admittance for different modes of uh, oscillation. And as you can see, thanks to the a, a specific design of the matching circuit of the surrounding multi-stage network, we are able to uh, make sure that only for the phase shift of 45 degrees, the imaginary part of the um, uh, the driving point impedance is. Uh, coming out of the Smith chart. For all the other uh, phase shifts, we want to make sure that the real part is greater than zero. And as I said, all these circles will be uh, coinciding or will be residing inside the Smith chart. And shown in the right-hand side is a simulation result uh, that uh, shows the real part and imaginary part of the driving point admittance at each port or port admittance. And as you can see, um, for a narrow range of frequencies around 115 gigahertz, we see a negative uh, real part uh, introduced by this uh, multiport structure. Uh, Professor, would this be a good time to break for questions or are we close to the end? We are close to the end. Okay. 
Okay, so the, uh, the design was this 114 gigahertz multiport circularly polarized radiator is implemented in 130 nanometer side by CMOS process. Shown in this slide is the die photo. The cavity with 1.5 millimeter uh, diameter is uh, seen at the center of the, uh, of the chip. The core radiator occupies an area of 2.4 by 2.4 square millimeter um, and consumes around 505 milliwatt of DC power. Also, the eight symmetric um, radiation slots at the, and, the, and the center hole responsible for suppressing the in-phase mode are visible in the dive photo. To, uh, so I'm not, uh, I, I didn't include the uh, measurement pattern, uh, me measurement setup or test setup of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, experiment of this chip. The test setup itself is very complicated because we want to measure the uh, circularly polarized radiation. But what we do here is that we are using a horn antenna on the receive side. Of course, it's a linearly polarized in order to measure the circular polarization uh, um, mode of this uh, radiator. To characterize the radiation pattern, the receive power was captured using a WR6 power detector while receiver horn antenna was swept along the uh, theta direction. So shown here is really the way that we rotate the horn antenna. So there is a theta phase shift here. And uh, uh, so we have also other uh, kind of phase uh, differences that I'm gonna explain uh, just in just a few minutes, okay? In just a few seconds. So the receiver antenna horn was swept along the theta direction in two orthogonal azimuthal planes, one at uh, phi equal zero plane and the other one phi equal 90 degrees. Since horn antenna polarization obviously was linear, whereas that of the radiated signal was of circular polarization, the received power in each plane was recorded for two orthogonal directions, namely for uh, angles of uh, alpha equal zero and alpha equal 90 between the receiver horn antenna and the sweep path. So this is a relative, relative phase shift, thereby completely capturing the received power. To measure the measured radiation patterns indicate a symmetric pattern, obviously, with respect to the Bohr site of theta equal zero, which is consistent with our, our expectation for a symmetric radiator. The total radiation pattern can then be calculated using the vector summation of two uh, cases, these two measurements, one at alpha equal zero, the other one at alpha equal 90 degrees. If we do the vector summation, we can calculate the, we can derive the measure, the overall measured uh, total radiation pattern of this antenna as not surprisingly symmetrical. And the measurement uh, is done at a distance of eight inches between the um, uh, device of device under test, in this case, radiator, and the received horn antenna. So uh, shown in this slide is the measured phase noise. Uh, the spectrum of the down converted signal is measured by signal analyzer of a key side signal analyzer indicating an RF frequency uh, of 114.1 gigahertz of the radiated signal. The radiator achieved a minimum phase noise of minus 99.3 dBc per hertz and one megahertz offset. Uh, please pay attention to the fact that this phase noise is the phase noise of the radiator plus the resonator. This is not the uh, phase noise of uh, only the oscillator. This is the oscillator and radiator together. And uh, this is the best and lowest phase noise ever reported by um, any millimeter wave integrated radiator um, so far. Uh, this low phase is mainly attributed to the high quality factor of the cavity resonance and the noise reduction due to the coupling of the loop ports to the cavity. So the cavity structure mainly is responsible for the, the phase noise. By the way, the phase noise could have been much lower if the cavity was used only for oscillation purpose and not for oscillation plus radiation. Because as we know, if we put, as soon as we insert the slots on the top metal layer in order to radiate the signal, eventually the phase noise is degraded. But yet the minus 99.3 dBc per hertz at one megahertz offset phase noise is the best noise reported by a radiator at this frequency. So shown here are the EIRP with respect to frequency and the DC power variation. Uh, the, HPT bias, uh, the, the HPT base current and supply voltage are swept in this case to study the impact of the loop impedance variation on the oscillation frequency. EIRP remained within 3 dB of its peak from 113.5 to 114.4 gigahertz, the high quality factor resonance of the uh, cavity leads to highly robust oscillation frequency in the presence of supply and bias variations. The ERP stays above 60 dBm and the oscillation frequency only varies by less than 1.3 gigahertz, around 1%. 
uh, while the DC power varies by 100% through different combination of collector and ba bias, bias, um, base biases. So shown here is a table of performance comparison. Uh, so this radiator achieves a circularly polarized radiation. It is only a one single element array that also acts like a oscillator, radiator, and power combiner. And it achieves the best EIRP per uh, DC power efficiency. And it achieves the lowest phase noise uh, recorded by literature. Of course, all these phases that you can see, you sh they should be scaled properly in order to provide the fair comparison. So in conclusion, an overview of the frequency generation techniques at millimeter wave frequencies was provided. Achieving high output power, low phase noise, and wide tuning range are among the most challenging issues in regard to millimeter wave frequency generation synthesis. A study of oscillation design, oscillator design at millimeter wave of, was provided. Circuit techniques such as inductive tuning and reactor tuning, incorporating loss and compensation networks were discussed. In designing uh, a millimeter wave pillar based synthesizer in silicon, the co-design co-optimization of the VCO and next stage divider would lead to far better performance compared to uh, other uh, conventional use techniques. Also, I introduced millimeter wave circularly polarized signal uh, radiator. In fact, I uh, kind of discussed that millimeter wave circularly polarized signals are highly useful for various emerging applications. Multiport signal generation radiation scheme offers a number of advantages, including high output power, high DC2 RF efficiency, and we can use a single antenna solution in order to produce a circular, circular, polar, circular polarized radiator. A new cavity-backed antenna structure in silicon was introduced, which offers very high quality factor resonance, multi-port signal generation, and circular polarized radiation. The amplifier loop and the cavity, the amplifier loop surrounding the cavity, together with the cavity, were designed for maximum power and efficiency. The cavity-backed multi-port circularly polarized radiator is capable of achieving 14.2 dBm EIRP with 5.2% DC2 EIRP conversion efficiency at 114 gigahertz. So the references are shown here. And toward the end, I would like to acknowledge my former students, PhD students in particular, uh, Dr. Peyman Nazari, Professor Jung Wang, and Dr. Liu Xiang, and Dr. Vipul Jain. And I would like to acknowledge Tower Jazz Semiconductor for Chief Application Global Foundries, especially uh, Mr. Ned Cahoon for providing chip uh, fabrication to Global Foundries. I would like to acknowledge Samsung Advanced Institute of Technology and Global Research Outreach Program for providing support for this uh, research and also National Science Foundation Awards. And finally, Keysight Technologies, especially Nima Shafir, right now is with uh, Infi uh, uh, Semiconductor and Dave Ha for providing test equipment. Thank you very much. Uh, very well. So I think we have a few questions uh, piled up. So let's go through those. So the first question, uh, I think it has, it might have to do with the earlier slides. And the question is, how fast could we change the frequency of these oscillators based on these frequency tuning mechanisms? Uh, could the professor please comment on these frequency tuning mechanisms if we want to do modulation uh, by using frequency tuning mechanisms for FSK transmitters? Okay, got a good question. So about FSK, uh, so it depends on FSK at very high frequencies. Using inductive tuning is quite possible. Uh, of course, we need to make sure that uh, the current controlling the inductive tuning here, like for example, go, let's go back here. So the main contributor for inductive tuning in this particular uh, architecture uh, was the tail current here, right? So if the uh, tail current is varying properly by the incoming signal, then we would be able to vary the inductance almost linearly with the uh, current here. And as a result, we can introduce a tuning and also we can uh, kind of perform FSK modulation. In fact, FSK modulation using this uh, uh, structure is quite feasible. About how fast or the fast acquisition uh, of how, how, how fast the tuning is, uh, tuning range is, uh, again, it is not really that difficult, uh, that different from the reactor based NCVCOs. The uh, startup of the oscillation is really dependent on how uh, strong the negative conductance is. If we can have a very strong negative conductance, then the startup would be faster. So it really depends on the strength 
of the negative conductance that leads to how fast the sort of operation or condition of the oscillation would be. Okay, uh, next question regarding oscillation radiation. First question is how to ensure the 45 degree phase shift between the stages? Are any phase shifters used? <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent question. So how to ensure the 45 degree phase shift? So uh, using two approaches. First of all, the 45 degree, uh, uh, 45 degree here is really achieved by the uh, symmetry of the structure. So you want to make sure that this eight port octagonal uh, cavity is very symmetrical. And the symmetry itself uh, yields 45 degree together with what we have here. If you look at the surrounding amplifier stages, they are also injecting the signal through the CPW feed lines to the cavity. And these two combinations, again, making sure that it is rotationally symmetrical, the layout is rotationally symmetrical, and also this loop surrounding this network, all contributing to this 45 degree phase shift variation. And also we designed a matching circuit such that other modes of operation taking place at, the, at other phase shifts will be going down. And the only mode that is extracted is the one attributed or associated with this 45 degree phase shift. So therefore, to make it some, to summarize it, the symmetry of the structure and also the surrounding active uh, multi-stage active load, active, active, active network that is used here together with the matching circuit uh, to guarantee 45 degree phase shift. Okay, uh, the next related question is, how do you control the impedance of the module for oscillation? What is the mode of the slot as the second resonance is utilized in radiation? Right. The mode of the slot in this case, uh, we are using the TEM mode, uh, which is really kind of given by the CPW line in order to make sure that the, CT, the CPW line feed line can basically create uh, enough negative conductance or inject the negative conductance here, right? Or uh, to, to this uh, cavity, we basically use the TM mode of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, of this CPW line. And what was the, uh, what was the other question? Uh, the first part of the question was, how do you control the impedance of the module for oscillation? So how can we control the, uh, the, so the control is really governed again by the surrounding structure, right? So the impedance of this, let me go back here. So the impedance of the cavity is pretty much determined by the size of the cavity, by the size of the slots and the length of the slots, and also uh, pretty much by the uh, also uh, uh, elevation of two metal layers. So imagine that there is a metal layer here and there is another metal layer underneath. So we are using a cavity, right? So the elevation or the height of the cavity, the, uh, the size of the cavity, and also the, the size of the slots pretty much determine the driving point and impedance of this structure. And as you can see, this driving point impedance is uh, dependent on the Z parameters of this multiport cavity. Now, how can we to make how, how can we make sure that the oscillation condition is satisfied? Mainly making sure that the overall uh, impedance here, here and here is zero, is by designing the surrounding network here. Look at this, by designing the matching network and the active devices surrounding the stru structure such that this condition is satisfied. In the steady state, the overall uh, admittance at each node contributed by the loop plus the uh, driving point admittance seen at each port of this multi-port cavity resonator are summed up to zero. And then, at, then the oscillation will be guaranteed. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, why is the radiation not symmetric along zero degrees and 90 degrees when the circuit appears to be symmetric? That's right. I mean, uh, this is uh, kind of, remember that, uh, first of all, our measurement was really done using a linearly polarized uh, uh, antenna, right? That's that. And also the cavity structure itself, we are using an on-chip cavity, right? And the on-chip cavity, the uh, elevation between the topmost metal layer and the lower part constituting this uh, cavity was really small. So therefore, some of these uh, kind of attributed to the structure of the cavity, some of this is attributed to the way that we basically do the measurement, perform the measurement. Uh, we don't have any circularly polarized received and receiver antenna. We are using a whole antenna to capture the signal and conduct the measurement. Okay. Uh, next question. 
how large is the area and volume of the cavity? Excellent question. So this is the structure itself is 2.4 by 2.4. This is considered the core cavity structure. The diameter is 1.5 millimeter. So this is 1.5 millimeter. So the cavity itself is around like, we can assume this is like 1.5 by 1.5. Okay. Uh, last couple of questions. Uh, what tool chain was used to build the cavity radiator? And how do the simulation results compare with the measured results? What was the first part of the question again? Uh, what tool chain? I'm guessing what kind of softwares and... Uh... Okay, we use HFSS. And what was the second question? Uh, so that HFSS was used to build and simulate and design the cavity resonator. Is that radiator uh, rather? HFSS in order to build the cavity, uh, to completely simulate and build the cavity. Yes. Okay. And the second question is, uh, how does the sim how do the simulation results compare with the measured results? Good question. So the oscillation frequency, as is predicted by oscillation by uh, by uh, by uh, simulation, is look at this 115 gigahertz, around 115 gigahertz. So what we achieved is 114.1 gigahertz. Oh, okay. Nice. So very close. <laughs> at least, at least uh, oscillation frequency is very close. When it comes to the phase noise profile, perhaps, you know, there is a deviation. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, because we are also radiating the signal. Radiation itself cannot be fully captured by uh, the simulation, but at least uh, we were able to, the, the frequency of oscillation comes very close to what we did. This is uh, kind of, uh, uh, this is, uh, let, me, let me go back to the back of a slide. I have a backup a slide here that I can. And by the way, in case you guys want to see what is the structure of this cavity, the way that is uh, this uh, layout, the cavity is uh, kind of shown here step by step. As I said, I didn't have time to go through the uh, structure of the cavity, but if you're interested, you can simply refer to our paper. But nevertheless, let's go back to the. Uh, so if you look at the oscillation, the oscillation is all uh, for all the pores are the same. This is the simulated uh, uh, out of the uh, HFSS extracted. Uh, uh, a structure and the oscillation is at 100, 100, 115 gigahertz frequency. Okay. So I think uh, those were all the questions we had. So uh, I think we have come to the end of our talk. Uh, so I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Payam Hidari uh, for giving us so much of his time. This was a very good talk, very interesting. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, and thanks also to all of our audience members. Uh, uh, we hope that you found it as informative and exciting as we did. So uh, we have more talks uh, scheduled. Uh, we have the next talk will be next month, third Wednesday, same as this month. Uh, the talk will be in the field of wireless power transfer. The speaker will be Dr. Alex Lidov, formerly CEO of uh, International Rectifier Corporation. So that should be a very interesting talk as well. So we'll be sending out all the details of that talk uh, soon. Uh, if you registered for this talk, you're part of our mailing list, so you'll be notified. Uh, also, this talk was also recorded and we'll be posting the links to the video and the slides in the next few days. So uh, uh, once again, if you registered, uh, you will receive those links via email. So uh, thank you again, everybody. Thanks again, Professor. And uh, we all hope to see you next time. Thank you very much. Have a nice day, guys. Bye.